everyone today in neurology our topic of discussion is movement disorders and in this lecture actually there's just one lecture for movement disorder and in this lecture what we are going to discuss is parkinson's disease um now uh, to all of you first of all in the previous lecture of pediatrics as you know i put a lot of videos right and uh, the bad thing you know what happened is when i uploaded those videos there was copyright claims in that video so what i came to know i cannot put more videos because uh, youtube they are very strict with this thing and uh, i cannot put videos so um, actually uh, i have some videos which of course i downloaded from youtube uh, and i used to show them in the class to the students um, just to tell them you know how the things look like uh, like when we do examination or how to catch the condition like how wh <clears throat> what kind of condition looks like how how it looks like so uh, when it comes to the movement disorder again uh, my first suggestion to you guys is I'm, I'm going to write down a few of the terms and uh, you can search them on YouTube and when you will see them then you would know like how they look like so the movement disorders are many and one of the thing remember this thing that most of the movement disorders uh, are related to the damage to the basal ganglias okay um, now uh, the basal ganglia functionality is so complicated that just to teach them you know it needs one to two hours so uh, simply um, you know basal ganglias are the group of nuclei which uh, or they are uh, many like stratum nigrum is there globus pallidus is there and thalamus is there and quadrate nucleus and many many structures are there so basically there are two pathways one is direct pathway and one is indirect pathway and uh, whenever we are doing any movement so this pathways work like in this way that uh, they are going to either control group of muscles to make the mus uh, movements smooth. So most of the movement disorders or movement problems when occur in the body, uh, much of them are due to the dysfunction or some abnormality in the basal ganglias. Okay. So first of all, take it as a homework. You have to see or learn the functions of basal ganglia is very 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 important because uh, otherwise of course like you will not understand many of the things okay so function of the basal ganglia if you have time look that second thing second thing whatever the terms i'm writing over here when you will see them on youtube or anywhere uh, you would understand like how they look like for example one of the thing is called as akathisia so what is akathisia is uh, restlessness okay like the people uh, who are uh, who have akathisia uh, they have voluntarily stereotyped uh, movements and it looks like that you know they are restless okay so they are in continuous motion so you can uh, this you can have uh, you can look at this thing then there is a movement disorder called as athetosis athetosis right so what is athetosis it is slow rhythming movements or especially in the distal parts like the fingers okay so athetosis is slow rhythming movements distally in the fingers look at this one now one thing ready ready means slow kinesia means movement this one is typically related with parkinson's disease so this is simply slow and small movement is called as bradi bradykinesia then there is chorea and now what is chorea um, these are brief movements uh, and irregular movements uh, but they look like some sort of pur purposeful movements okay and chorea can occur in many conditions like rheumatic fever or syndrome chorea and many 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 other conditions you know they give chorea um, this diadochokinesia, uh, as you know, like uh, this is like when someone cannot do repeated uh, 
this to ko kai ke kinesia so when someone uh, cannot uh, do rapid alternating fast movements uh, by the way uh, one of the thing like if you will uh, open the diagnostic playlist uh, i had lecture about how to do neurological examination with videos thanks there is no copyright claim in that until now and second thing is i have cerebellar examination lecture so you can you can look that okay then there is dyskinesia dyskinesia it's like bradycardia dyskinesia is um, slowed movement dyskinesia is like whenever this is there so dysfunctional so uh, any involuntary movement we can use this term uh, okay like there is something called as tardif dyskinesia uh, which is the side effect of many antipsychotic drugs then there is a term called as dystonia okay there is dys um, kinesia there is um, dys uh, tonia so remember it is about the tone right so uh, in this one what happens is like uh, uh, there is a contraction of both the agonist and as well as antagonist muscles together so there is what you can say sustained twisting or tonic movements or that's why we call them as dystonic postures or dystonic movements um okay very important one which you must see is hemi and bellismus okay so hemi bellismus is um unilateral flinging type of movements okay so this thing so same like bradykinesia there is tachykinesia like that is acceleration of movements then there is tics uh Ticks are brief, repeated actions, which people do due to inner urge. They can be suppressed, and remember, like there can be vocal ticks, there can be motor ticks, and they disappear during sleep. Very important thing. And tremor, uh, as you know, like the tremor term. These are rhythmic, involuntary uh, muscle contractions, right? So um, <laughs> now. Um, what what we what we have to do is uh, uh, like these terms we you you are going to see okay because like we i have to cover parkinson's disease in this lecture um, uh, and uh, if we had time we will talk about the tremors because tremors can be caused in, in by many conditions like cerebellar diseases can see can give tremors again you can see that video which i uploaded for cerebellar examination uh, alcohol can give anxiety can give hyperthyroidism can give parkinson's disease can give so tremors can be given by certain kind of many conditions right so uh, we will discuss about that thing okay so uh, like this one chorea as i told you it can be in huntington disease it can be in sle it can be in rheumatic fever in that case we call it as syndham chorea there is something called as chorea gravidarum which occurs in pregnancy okay so same thing uh, same thing with um, dystonias okay there are different type of dystonias and uh, things like this so uh, anyhow uh, we will discuss parkinson's disease uh, today right so uh, like you can see these videos of course like it will get, it will tell you how they really look like uh, now um, parkinson's disease is uh, see parkinson's disease is a movement disorder of course because there is bradykinesia there is tremors um, there is uh, there could be a kinesia right so of course like it is a movement disorder but uh, it can also be classified as um, a degenerative condition right so uh, what is like as you can see Parkinson's disease a disorder of the basal ganglia and is uh, recognized as one of the most common neurologic disorders yes it is like this like uh, basically this is Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder the first most common neurodegenerative disorder is Alzheimer's okay so this is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder so it is so common that it affects one percent of individuals older than 60 years when you will go to the neurology ward 
you will see Parkinson's disease patients. It is very common, okay? So, like what are the clinical features are there? Of course, uh, we will discuss on them. So, you understand it is a movement disorder as well as a degenerative disorder, right? So, uh, basically, this Parkinson's disease is affects the motor system, but with time, there are many non-motor symptoms also started appearing, okay? So, uh, now, what, uh, how we can start the thing, okay? And remember, Parkinsonism, okay? Uh, what you can say is not uh, Parkinson's disease. Parkinsonism is basically, uh, uh, you can say, um, Parkinson's Parkinsonism, we name uh, to a group of symptoms, okay? Uh, for example, anyone who have tremor, bradykinesia, rigidity, or postural instability, a very good mnemonic to remember this thing is called as TRAP, okay? What happened in Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease? There is a TRAP, T-R-A-P, T for tremor, R for rigidity, uh, A for uh, akinesia or bradykinesia, and P for postural instability. So anyone who have these four symptoms, we call it as Parkinsonism, okay? So, the features of Parkinsonism are present in Parkinson's disease. But, see, what I'm saying, Parkinsonism is a name given to a group of symptoms. Parkinson's disease have those group of symptoms. So, that's why we called it as Parkinson's disease. But the cause of Parkinsonism can be due to some other things, like drugs can cause Parkinsonism. Antipsychotic drugs, especially, can cause Parkinsonism, okay? So, uh, like this way. Uh, now, uh, uh, many of the neurodegenerative conditions can give Parkinsonism, okay? Many of the drugs can give Parkinsonism. Many of the toxins can give Parkinsonism and so on and so forth, okay? So, uh, let's start discussing uh, uh, what is Parkinson's disease, okay? Uh, now, uh, if you can see over here, there is loss of pigmented dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra. So what is happening? The dopaminergic neurons are less in substantia nigra. Why it is called a substantia nigra? Because this is, uh, they, they are black in color, okay? And there is there can be the presence of levy bodies. Uh, now, again, this is about like the guy who um, describe this thing and uh, this is like the stages of development of Parkinson's disease right so see like uh, this photo is taken from uh, a website and you can see what they are showing you the brain in cross section see here they they are showing the cut section and this blackish area is called a substantia nigra what happened in Parkinson's disease? Like the, there is degeneration of the substantia nigra, and see they are appearing less blackish. Okay, so what is happening here? Basically, there is degeneration of the dopaminergic neuron neurons, right? So again, like this is like how they are showing uh, the basal ganglias. Okay, this is the thalamus, and this is the thalamus. Uh, this one is the uh, subthalamic nucleus, this is the globus pallidus interna, this is the globus pallidus externa, this is the putamen, and uh, this is the substantia nigra, right? And they, they are showing the connections of both direct as well as indirect pathway uh, to show you. Okay, I would like to start my Parkinson's disease explanation from this case. Why? Because if you will remember this case, you will, you will know the features. A 75-year-old woman notices that she can no longer deal the cards at her bridge club because her hands have become clumsy and slow. Her handwriting has become spidery and small. She cannot roll over in bed. She shuffles when she walks. Okay. Now, I will explain to you. Bad thing, I cannot show you video because if I will show you one video, or by the way, you can see yourself on YouTube. 
uh, that will give you a good insight about this disease okay to understand or to remember see uh, what you read what you uh, you can forget but what you see uh, basically there is less chances you, you will forget because th that stays in the mind uh, in the like there is pictorial memory as well so uh, many people they have strong pictorial memory okay uh, as I told you what is the epidemiology right uh, it is so common that uh, it increases with rising age uh, and after 60 years of age around 1% of the patients the people they have this thing it is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's the mean age of onset is around 60 years okay the mean age of onset is around 60 years now uh, before going on to sign and symptoms see what are the causes of Parkinson's disease actually exactly it is not known but um, uh, before going on to the clinical features of what I can uh, talk about the etiology is uh, in this way that okay that uh, see some of the time it is sporadic cases like what is sporadic that uh, we don't find any family history we don't found any anything in the genes but the person have parkinson's disease so what they found like when the cases are sporadic what they found that there is some oxidative stress okay uh, to dopaminergic neurons right uh, and they found uh, like uh, oxidative stress they also found like some toxins uh, like pesticides they also found aging as one of the factor okay uh, <clears throat> which can cause which can lead to sporadic cases okay this is the most common way around 90% of the patient of Parkinson's disease are sporadic cases the other causes can be familial <clears throat> around 10% of the cases so what they found in these patients like uh, they found um, alpha uh, <clears throat> synuclein or LRRK2 mutations okay uh, in an autosomal do dominant fashion okay and also they found a mutation in Parkin uh, gene in autosomal recessive form or also they found some more uh, mutations like sometimes if it is occurring in a very young age so they found that there is mutation in um, pink or uh, dj-1 mutations are there okay so uh, whenever it is autosomal dominant fashion they, there is mutation in this one whenever it is on autosomal recessive there is mutation in this one and whenever it is uh, juvenile onset there is mutation in this one they found right and also uh, they, they found one more thing in Parkinson's disease uh, what they found is uh, that it is also <clears throat> what you can say um, okay uh, first of all like uh, let me tell you more about like uh, the familiar causes in many of the books you will found a lot of genes mutations what they found remember guys all the conditions which are very common Basically, they run a lot of investigations, or sorry, run a lot of research programs, okay? And they found a lot of things. <coughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, they, they found a lot of uh, different type of uh, um, associations and things like this, okay? Basically, you don't need to know them, okay? Uh, because... Uh, at this level no one is going to ask you what is LRRK uh, gene or what is pink uh, one gene okay like uh, basically PE PTE and or uh, uh, what is PTE and is basically uh, threonine uh, protein kinase induced kinase one okay so uh, like you, you don't have to uh, remember these things right uh, but rather uh, you must know that there are uh, some of the causes could be due to um, gene mutations okay this is the thing 
so uh, uh, this is the important thing uh, and like uh, they, they also found uh, some other factors okay uh, though not uh, you can say 100% association is there but they found a lot of association uh, for example um, what they found is uh, uh, like this pesticides I told you they found like the people who are uh, exposed to pesticides have are have increased risk and there is studies which says like smoking uh, protect or you can say have some good effects like uh, the people who are smokers they get less Parkinson's disease okay so things like this but of course like you don't have to uh, go in too much detail of that okay so uh, <clears throat> as I told you one of the mnemonic is trap so remember T is for tremor, R is for rigidity, A is for akinesia or bradykinesia, okay, akinesia or bradykinesia, right, so and P is for postural instability. So this is a mnemonic or these are the cardinal motor symptoms of uh, Parkinson's disease, okay. So, uh, okay, one more thing like, you know, uh, because like we whenever we take history uh, we have to talk about we have to ask or we will have to see like how much uh, the patient is at risk of getting this condition uh, for example uh, whenever you found family history of Parkinson's disease um, in males if the patient is a male if we have a history of head injury if the person is living in rural area okay and uh, or if you have exposure to some certain neurotoxins like uh, uh, there is a neurotoxin called as MTTP okay MPTP okay that it's a neurotoxin uh, so you know all these are risk factors okay all are, these are risk factors for getting uh, Parkinson's disease and now one more thing there are some protective factors as, as well like I was telling you about smoking right uh, so the protective factors uh, or like which studies found like they can protect the patients from Parkinson's uh, disease is coffee okay uh, smoking um, NSAIDs use okay um, uh, as well as estrogen uh, replacement in postmenopausal women so these are protective factors okay which offer some protection so simply there is loss of dopaminergic neurons in substantia nigra so what is happening on there is decreased dopamine right so uh, basically when there is decreased dopamine in stratum uh, what it leads to is in disinhibition of indirect pathway and in decreased activation of direct pathway so when these two things are uh, there so basically all the motor area of the cortex it goes under uh, inhibition okay and that's why everything becomes slow so uh, now as you can see what is bradykinesia bradykinesia is slow movements right so uh, they like they have slow small amplitude movements okay uh, and uh, they have small they cannot perform rapid alternating movements they have they have difficulty in initiating movements okay so that's why they have this sense of weakness right so if you know that concept of positive symptoms as well as negative symptom see bradykinesia is a negative symptom because this is something uh, like the normal people can do but these patients cannot do so something is taken away from the body we call it as negative symptom okay so now when these patients have facial bradykinesia okay so basically uh, see all the movements are slow so they have decreased blink rate and their face they have a typical look on their face okay and like there's their speech because to talk you know we need movement of the muscles so the move the movement of the muscle is not uh, uh, fast so their uh, sound is softer and monotonal like when they speak they speak in one tone okay and in more advanced cases the speech can be slurred and poorly articulated and difficult to stand so and of course drooling can occur 
so due to this facial expression they have mask like faces it, it seems like the the person is wearing a mask okay and again uh, trunkal bradykinesia like the trunk the muscles are slow so there is slowness or difficulty in rising from chair turning in bed or walking okay of course like everything is and we you can also call it as freezing okay so like when the disease is advanced like it's, it seems like the patient is freezed so this thing is there and uh, now imagine due to this bradykinesia what happens that their handwriting is small as well so we call it as micrographia and there is difficulty using the hand for fine movements or fine activities like using key or kitchen utensils uh, okay so uh, remember from that scenario uh, like she was having difficulty in playing cards okay so that thing is important now normally our body is maintaining some tone but in this one the tone is increased which is called as rigidity okay and so it is a type of a positive symptom like something which is present in the body and now it is exaggerated so it is a positive symptom so some patient may describe stiffness in the limbs so basically what happens in this one uh, we get two type of rigidities in this one one is called as cogwheel rigidity okay and uh, there is a lead pipe rigidity as well now what is cogwheel you know have, have you seen the ships how how their steering looks like the old ships are talking about so if you remember if you have seen movies that you know the captain he uh, used to uh, turn the ship and when he moved that cog wheel you know or the cog wheel uh, for example if you have seen uh, in old movies that they used to what you can say uh, take out water from the well right so uh, that 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 is also a cog wheel so uh, if you know uh, what is uh, if you have seen and if you have the concept of cog wheel or uh, you know in big clocks there is a special type of uh, what you can say rotator uh, wheel okay uh, which when, when it rotates you know it makes sound of tuck 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 like this right so uh, there is basically a while movement you know it, there is a jerky movement so when basically we check their muscle tone uh, we found that their muscle tone is increased and we found jerky movement okay due to tremors we call that that thing as cogwheel rigidity and the last thing is tremors okay so they have resting tremors guys forget anything never forget they have resting tremors okay so uh, they they do a pin rolling movement when you will see the patient their hands are they are resting and their hands are in their lap you will found like the, you, it, will, they, it will feel like they are rolling the pills okay so they are the, these are asymmetric uh, 4 to 5 hertz frequency pill roll rolling type of movements okay we call it as resting tremors so these are the four main features of uh, what you can say um, Parkinson's disease right now uh, a very important thing is like they have postural instability right which we have already gone through uh, which, we have, which we already know so see there is resting tremors there is rigidity there is bradykinesia there is mass like fish facies there is hypophonia there is monotonous speech monotonous speech is also called as apros 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 there is dysarthria there is micrographia like small handwriting there is shuffling gait with decreased arm swing there can be freezing okay and now there will be postural instability now postural instability is a late finding okay Post postural instability is a late finding okay uh, in, in in these patients so now to tell you more about this one uh, when the condition advances or the condition become advanced there are other problems also arising like for example there is bradyphrenia so what I'm saying is there will be uh, brady Phrenia. What is bradyphrenia? It is slow thinking, slow to respond. Okay, 
even you will ask them their name or anything information they are slow to respond because their thinking is slow and their response is slow right so that is what is bradyphrenia so they can also have depression anxiety as well as dementia right so uh, they have sleep disturbances they have orthostatic hypotension they have anxiety and they have constipation like these are the autonomic symptoms of course they can have urinary retention impotence or sexual dysfunction as well okay so these are the non motor symptoms of you can say parkinson's disease uh, so see this one she lives with a husband who is in good health she has never smoked her parents both lived into their 80s without anything similar so it means she is a case of a spora sporadic parkinson's disease and her sister is alive and well she is on medication for hypertension and a hiatus hernia now uh, this one is uh, what you can say the full story about that thing and okay I'll leave this thing we had already discussed like what are the thing so now see on examination she walks with a flex posture a shuffling gait and no arm swing she has moderate bradykinesia and rigidity in both arms okay and what is going on there is no tremor or cerebral defect her eye movements are normal for age her pulse and blood pressure are normal right so all these things are the same thing which are repeating uh, okay uh, leave this thing postural instability you can see i already talk about what is that that there is postural instability like which is imbalance or loss of writing reflexes okay and uh, how we assess the postural inst instability is by assessing when the patient is standing with the eyes open and then pulling his or her shoulder back towards the examiner remember while doing this thing never let the patient fall okay because the patients can fall so uh, now guys the important thing to uh, what you can say go through is uh, these are the details of this all dementia and this thing okay how we can diagnose the patient of parkinson's disease this is very 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 important so guys um, remember parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis okay parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis uh, uh, you can see like there is a uk criteria for diagnosis of uh, uh, what you can say parkinson's disease simply uh, it's a clinical diagnosis if anyone have bradykinesia rest tremors or rigidity and other supportive criteria like uh, 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 what you can say um, what is there there is loss of dopamine if we will give them dopamine if they are responding well so that's a supportive criteria for that as well okay and there is no alternative diagnosis you can do right so see bradykinesia and at least one of the following muscular rigidity tremor or postural instability this is the step one in the diagnosis of parkinson's syndrome okay secondly of course we will take a detailed history to exclude or exclusion criteria for pd for example see if they are taking any anti psychotic drugs okay if they have more than one affected relative okay so all these things of course we are looking for any other cause right and step 3 is supportive criteria for pd for example <clears throat> anyone three or more required for diagnosis of definitive pd anyone who have unit later onset and there is external response to levodopa anyone anyone have resting tremor present or severe uh, levodopa induced chorea anyone who have progressive disorder anyone who have persistent asymmetry affecting the site of onset okay <clears throat> so of course parkinson's disease have a lot of differential diagnosis because many disease they 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 have the same they share like many common signs and symptoms so that's why the thing is important so <clears throat> now guys uh, when we when we diagnose the patient with parkinson's disease uh, let's see parkinson's disease is a clinical diagnosis no laboratory biomarker exists for the condition but yes what we can do we can do mri okay we can do a ct scan 
they can be unremarkable okay we can do positron emission tomography PET or single photon emission CT like SPECT which may show finding consistent with Parkinson's disease for example like the substantia nigra is degenerated okay so this thing and of course like many other tests we do for Parkinson's disease so guys you know now I will tell you deep uh, tell you talk about the treatment of Parkinson's disease which will sound a little difficult to you guys but again easy to understand difficult a little difficult treatment because you, there is a lot of drugs which we can give to the patients but on the same side um, easy to uh, remember okay um, there is a uh, different mnemonics uh, to remember what are the drugs um, which can treat Parkinson's disease, right? Uh, see, what is the approach? Dopamine is less. We have to provide dopamine, right? Number one, this, this thing, uh, keep in your mind, okay? We have to provide dopamine. So, the important thing in treatment the mainstay of the treatment is basically levodopa and carbidopa. Now, they come together in a combined form called as SINMET worldwide. Okay. When we give anyone orally dopamine, of course, the dopamine will level will go high all over the body, right? Not just in the brain, all over the body. So, we combine dopamine with certain drug, okay, uh, so that that drug cannot pass the blood-brain barrier and it should deactivate dopamine in the blood. So, that's why levodopa and carbidopa, what we do, we give these two combined drugs because one drug cross the blood-brain barrier and provide dopamine in the brain. The second drug which cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, it will stay in the blood outside the brain and keep on inactivating dopamine outside, right? So, the mainstay of the treatment is dopa, levodopa and carbidopa. Or there is one more combination called as levodopa with benzirazide. Okay, it comes by the name of prolopa. So, the goal is to provide control of sign and symptom for, an, for as long as possible without minimizing, uh, sorry, while minimizing adverse effects, okay? So what we give is we give levodopa coupled with a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor, which is carbidopa. And medication usually provide good symptomatic control for, of motor signs for four to six years. And if the things cannot be controlled by medications, then we go on surgery. Okay. So now, uh, a lot of neuroprotective treatment is also on the way research is going on, but. Uh, most of the things like are not fully understandable okay uh, much of the thing you can understand from here now see the mainstay of the treatment is levodopa with carbidopa right other than that we can give a lot of other things basically what is going on dopamine levels are decreased in the brain on the same side acetylcholine levels are increased in the brain so we have to create a balance between these two, right? So we can give them anticholinergic drugs as well. We can give them dopamine agonists. We can give them amantadine, okay? Amantadine, we can give them MAOI inhibitors, okay? Or monamine oxidase inhibitors, this one I'm talking about, okay? We can give them other drugs like COMT inhibitor, COMT COMT inhibitors, okay? So, and we can give them the dopamine, of course. So, this one is like, you know, uh, we are giving them levodopa with an inhibitor which should inactivate that thing outside the brain, right? Uh, now, um, uh, to tell you the full treatment, you know, the, the, the name of the drugs which are available uh, to treat Parkinson's disease, uh, I will talk about them. And then, of course, like we are going to finish this lecture. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, see, uh, the, the first, uh, what you can say, uh, okay, 
Uh, before that, you know, there are different mnemonics. Like uh, there is one thing called as you know, all loves boxing matches. Like A for Amantadine, L for Leo Vodopa, B for Promocriptine, and M for M A O I inhibitors. Okay, so uh, different mnemonics are there. Again, I think you can you can Google them. There is one mnemonic called as cold salad. Okay, so uh, different mnemonics are there to remember the drugs, right? So. A cold salad is like uh, one of the famous one. So, uh, how we manage the patients of Parkinson's disease? Medications are available and surgeries are also available, right? First of all, is this thing. Now, and of course, like symptomatic treatment, we have to give to the patient. Okay. So, uh, what you can say, uh, the mainstay of the treatment, as we I told you, it is levodopa, okay, which is coupled with carbidopa or uh, benzazeride okay so these things is there one of the thing which we can give is COMT inhibitors c-o-m-t inhibitors okay uh, okay what are the name of these drugs uh, i will just write one name uh, it is tolcapone okay now what is COMT inhibitors okay uh, with uh, from that diagram it is basically um, catechol O methyl transferase inhibitors. Okay, basically, this is the enzyme which uh, which degrades dopamine. Okay, so when we give them COMT inhibitors, what will happen? The dopamine will not be degraded and simply there will be more and more dopamine in the brain. Okay, so this COMT inhibitors are basically used as an add on therapy, right? This is basically used as a as an add on therapy for the patients who are already receiving uh, levodopa and carbidopa. Uh, by the way, uh, there are a few of the, what you can say, uh, drugs, uh, sorry, phenomena in Parkinson's disease, disease. I will talk about them in, in the end. So, tolka, uh, tolkapone or entacapone, like they both are uh, the drugs from the same group, okay. So uh, now we can give them because we want to increase dopamine. So we can give them dopamine agonists. Okay, dopamine agonists we can give. So there are many uh, dopamine agonists are there in the market. Okay, uh, which basically uh, uh, what you can say act like dopa. So for example, uh, the name of the drugs is bromocriptine. Okay, as well as Pergolite. Okay, and there are many others. Ropinirol uh, is there. Uh, Pramipexol is there. Cabergoline is there. Cabergoline is there, right? So Ropinirol and uh, all these drugs, of course, like they are dopamine agonist. Okay, so <clears throat> now uh, remember that there is a lot of side effects of dopamine agonist, like constipation, nausea. Okay. Uh, and all this things one all, all this one okay one drug is called as apomorphine okay now what is this drug apomorphine uh, basically uh, apomorphine is uh, uh, it acts same like dopamine agonist right uh, so the, what what is the, the the like why i'm mentioning this drug here because it is the only drug which is available in injection form right and we can give the patients like uh, to control the symptoms okay then i show you m m a monoamine oxidase uh, inhibitors okay so basically it is m mono amine oxidase b inhibitors so what are the name of the, the drugs uh, most of the books you know they give two drugs sledgeline okay and ressa Okay, so these, these are the name of the drugs. So what it do, uh, as I, like I show you from this diagram, okay, MAOI inhibitors, simply what, what they are doing is simply they are increasing the amount of dopamine, okay? Why? Because they inhibit monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme which break down dopamine again, right? So simply uh, this is the uh, function of this one. Okay, then there is, oh, sorry, <clears throat> then there is a drug called as Amentadine, Amentadine, okay. 
so see there are there is a lot 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 options available so amantadine and uh, as well as anticholinergics as what i was told, telling you anticholinergics um, they are given uh, basically to treat the motor symptoms okay so uh, for example uh, any patient who have like uh, the motor symptoms are uh, becoming worse or they are too much so then we can give them these drugs okay because they have a very good um, um, like tremors or all the motor symptoms which the patient have like they, they have a very good effect on that so uh, this is about what you can say the treatment of Parkinson's disease okay uh, and now what I was talking about is uh, remember uh, there is uh, like the, the treatment doesn't go that much simple because there are certain uh, problems which we have to see for example uh, when we give the patient a dose of levodopa so at that time you know the dose of the dopamine is good in the body and the patient feel relief and there is no symptoms but uh, for example what will happen before there's a time of the next dose of course the symptom will become worse and then they will take one more dose and your symptoms will become good so there is a lot of fluctuation in the symptoms when we put the patient on levodopa okay it is called as levodopa related fluctuations okay uh, and especially you know sometimes the levodopa effects are also delayed for example if the patient is taking the this drug with me meals okay the absorption is less uh, one more thing which can occur in these patients is um, you can say uh, what the thing which i'm telling you uh, like the symptoms are becoming bad before there is time of the next dose we call this thing as end of dose deterioration or wearing off okay so remember there is on and off type of process like the patients have symptoms and then the symptoms are relieved on everyday basis right so uh, uh, to 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 cover this thing of course like uh, uh, we have to adjust the drugs and we have to put some add on drugs so that the patient they don't have these kind of things on everyday basis okay so uh, this is very important okay uh, and that's why like we 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 use some other add on drugs now other than that guys uh, which i talk about uh, 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 talk about is uh, see medication formally used for symptomatic benefits is mo inhibitors dopamine agonist and this one and symptomatic therapy advanced disease or dyskinesia is there uh, of course we use add on drugs and there's a too much detail of that one um, okay uh, when there is motor fluctuations we go for um, as i told you anticholinergics things uh, can be given we can give compt inhibitors and all this one okay um, okay now uh, this one is like the motor fluctuations and troublesome peak dose dyskinesia right which i was talking about and uh, uh, okay and now okay before going on to this topic i would i would uh, i would like to tell you something um, related to parkinson's disease uh, sometimes you know what happens like uh, the patient cannot be relieved by the drugs or the symptoms are becoming very 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 bad then we go for surgical options okay um, and surgical options you know uh, what what are the surgical options which are available there can be thalamotomy pallidotomy and um, thalamic stimulation surgery or dbs or deep brain stimulation okay deep brain stimulation so what is this one by the way uh, they uh, they they put a device inside the body and they take the wire and they keep it near the uh, fibers which release dopamine and what happens like uh, whenever you turn on that device you know it gives current over there and there is more and more release of dopamine and the patient would get relief of the symptoms uh, of course like uh, highly expensive and of course new treatment uh, if you want to really see how it works guys there is a very interesting video on youtube just write uh, deep stimulation brain stimulation parkinson's disease real patient and you will see a female you know female patient she will show you how her symptoms were before and she, when she will turn on the device how her sim 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 symptoms improve after turning off the on the device okay so very 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 important okay Yes, one thing which I wanted to talk about, guys, this is not the only treatment for the condition. Remember, this is the treatment just for the dopamine. 
uh, there is a lot of other other things for example if there is depression you will give drugs for depression if there is sleep problem you will deal with that so of course symptomatic treatments goes with it okay uh, nowadays like a lot of new uh, therapies they are researching on neuroablative lesion surgeries transplantation gene therapy okay uh, are also there if there is like dementia with that give them rivastigmine or don't prison okay and in them you know and to avoid the anticholinergic drugs so this thing and if there is anxiety give them ssris if they have sleep problems give them benzodiazepines okay as well as uh, other drugs so also if they have hallucinations again uh, hallucination could be a side effect of the drugs you know the patient is using so of course like uh, uh, deal with that so uh, now, uh, of course, like we refer them to other departments as well to take care of them. Uh, there are other Parkinsonism uh, syndromes as well. For example, uh, Parkinson's with Levy bodies. Okay, it's one thing is called as progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, what is what is what happens in these patients is basically they have vertical gaze palsy. There is something called as cortico basal syndrome. Uh, and what happens in this one like they have uh, uh, multiple systems are involved in this one okay like especially the basal regions so that there is multiple system atrophy as well okay uh, which have three types but of course like you don't have to go in too much detail of that so um, now guys other than this uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, there is uh, um, sorry just give me a, I don't know what's wrong with this slide but um, I can I can fix it in this way that uh, I will move it up and that thing down okay uh, now uh, <clears throat> there are other movement disorders as well okay for example there could be okay other movement disorders okay uh, other movement disorders are also there for example, there could be Huntington's disease. Okay, there could be um, dystonias. Okay, um, there could be tick disorders, and there could be um, one thing called as Tourette syndrome. Okay, as well as uh, many others are also there right uh, like of course which can cause some movement disorders so for example um, uh, i will talk about a little about you know all these things um, what is huntington's disease uh, this is a condition of course like there is movement disorder it's a movement disorder and it is autosomal type autosomal uh, dominant uh, if you know what is trinucleotide repeat expansion so uh, CAG okay uh, I will explain you this thing a little you know yeah, like uh, you know the DNAs uh, or the genes you know the, what they are made up of they are made up of nucleotides right so uh, how the genetic code is identified because the, the repeat the nucleotides are repeating in some fashion so what happens in the like sometimes we have more than uh, like the repeats, uh, these repeats, okay. For example, in my genes, there is uh, cytosine, adenosine, and guanine, okay, uh, is there uh, somewhere, okay, and there are some repeats, okay. But sometimes there is these kind of uh, repeats are too much that now they can they can cause problem uh, with, uh, with the patient, right with the person so uh, basically this trinucleotide repeat expansion is present on chromosome number four okay like on chromosome number four uh, what happens like there is too much repeats of CAG okay and this that's why it, this 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 gene is also called as Huntington genes okay so um, that's what happens in these patients okay and what happened due to this abnormal trinucleotide repeat expansion that there is 
cerebral atrophy okay which affect the striatum which affect the direct pathway as well as the indirect pathway and the patient present with uh, Huntington disease disorder okay Huntington disease now uh, this disease show one process which we call as anticipation okay we call this thing as this disease show anticipation so what is anticipation if someone is carrying this abnormal gene or Huntington gene on chromosome number four okay so they will have Huntington disease uh, when they uh, reach at the age of 35 to 45 okay they will start having the symptoms of Huntington disease before that they will be normal now it is autosomal dominant guys so what will happen when they have a baby basically this repeat trinucleotide re, re, uh, gene ex, like repeat expansion will be increase in their babies so maybe if the father have Huntington onset at the age of 42 maybe the son will be having the onset at the age of 30, 38 and maybe the son of that guy will maybe have the onset of condition at the age of 35 or maybe so, so you see as the gen there is generation to generation transfer the onset of the condition become earlier earlier and earlier so we call this condition as uh, anti like you see this phenomena as anticipation okay so what happens in these patients is that they they it, the the treat the clinical features it start with clumsiness and uh, irritability uh, which can uh, lead to uh, like they may have psychosis as well as chorea okay like chorea is like the abnormal movements okay so uh, there is memory impairment uh, because what's going on there is global cerebral atrophy right so all the cerebral cortex it becomes atrophic so uh, they have what you can say uh, uh, loss of memory loss of intellectual capacity is there okay and uh, Chorea in Huntington disease start with uh, some eye, abnormal eye movement, eyebrow movement, shrugging of shoulders and these kind of pseudo purposeful movements, okay. And uh, then it progresses to hemibelismus, okay, or bellism, uh, like uh, these are basically dance-like movements, okay. And they have de depression and irritability and all these things, okay. So the bad thing about this condition is what? That, uh, you know... Uh, how we diagnose this condition of course you can do mri which will show you uh, cerebral atrophy and of course like you are going to do genetic testing okay and in genetic testing they will found the uh, uh, trinucleotide repeats on huntington gene which is on chromosome number four and it is cag repeat cytosine uh, adenine and guanine repeat right so that is there there is no treatment for this condition okay like we can just give supportive treatment like if there is depression you will give antidepressants if there is sleep problems you will give sleep medications if there is psychiatric psychosis you can give antipsychotic medications if uh, we can use benzodiazepine or neuroleptic drugs for chorea and for dystonias we can give them botulism toxin but there is no treatment for this condition and most of the people who have this Huntington disease they ultimately die okay so that's a very bad type of condition so uh, dystonias uh, this like why I mention it over here it is the third most common type of movement disorder okay movement I am not saying uh, degenerative disorder I am talking about movement disorder the first most common movement disorder is Parkinson's disease the second most common movement disorder is essential tremor and the third one is dystonia so what is dystonia of course there is dysfunction in the tone okay so uh, whenever like these people they are in stress or fatigue or they they, they are becoming emotional you know uh, they have they, they develop this kind of um, what you can say uh, thing like dystonia for example they uh, they can have dystonia of any part of the body of course right so like uh, how we treat them we can give again botulism toxin okay or anticholinergic drugs or muscle relaxants or benzodiazepines or whatever right things like this okay um, ticks like I think you know what is ticks it is like very very uh, common type of term 
and many people they have text there could be vocal text there could be motor text for example blinking of the eyes head jerking shoulder shrugging uh, grinding of teeth okay uh, some people you know their mouths keep on open like keep open all the time okay sustained mouth openers you can say so any type of uh, for example some of the people they have vocal tics like coughing they or grunting or throat clearing type of thing so of course like uh, these things are very common and dopamine blockers can be given uh, clonidine can be given for these kind of conditions okay torrid syndrome is not so important guys but i just mention it over here because it is uh, a movement disorder and uh, uh, what happens like uh, uh, the onset is before the age of 18 okay and uh, uh, males are more commonly affected than females and what they have they have basically ticks one interesting thing about torrid syndrome which I, I want to tell you is uh, they have vocal ticks okay they have vocal ticks and many of these children because the onset is before 18 years of age uh, they are hyperactive they they have uh, some personality disorders like they are uh, you can say impulsive or compulsive behavior they have right so they are hyperactive and they, they have sleeping abnormalities they have uh, learning abnormalities as well okay uh, so uh, what happens like you know uh, it typically begins at the age of four to six years of age and there is uh, around 10 to 12 years of age it become very severe and later on you know they they found relief from this uh, torrid syndrome so that's all about movement disorder and uh, thank you for listening guys